Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> Welcome to our conference. And now we are starting the first plenary session. A broad overview of the new European Commission initiatives regarding the funding of the research and innovation sector. Before we start, uh, I'd like to say a few words to, the, to our future presenters uh, and moderators. We'll take the stage here throughout these two days. That uh, one of the main uh, successes of the every conference is punctuality. So, please uh, mind the time. Uh, we and we, I think, will have successful uh, se session and successful conference. And of course, there will be a lot of time for discussions in the work groups and in the coffee breaks. So, our th uh, this first session will break at two o'clock. And now, I'd like to ask on stage two gentlemen. Uh, there will be uh, Stefan Hermans from European Commission, Director General for Research and Innovation. Please take your seat. And uh, the second, Professor Fulvio Esposito, Italian delegate to the ERA Steering Group on Human Resources and Mobility. Uh, I think, time permitting, after these two presentations, we'll have some short discussion or we'll take your questions. And now I'd like, uh, without further ado, uh, to ask. Mr. Herman, to start the presentation, please. First challenge. All right, good afternoon, um, and also from my side, uh, from the Commission, uh, on behalf of the Commission, welcome to this event. Uh, we're very grateful for the Lithuanian Presidency of organizing this, and we were very happy to be in a position to uh, sponsor this event and to also bring a big group of people, including many non-usual suspects, here together for this, uh, for this meeting. The tone of this conference, the political tone actually, was set um, earlier this year in July during the informal council when ministers for research came together here in Vilnius and actually discussed the skills agenda for researchers. And obviously many of the topics you've heard about already, like doctoral training, attractiveness of research careers, mobility issues, were very much discussed from a political level. What we are here uh, for today and tomorrow is actually to go and discuss this in a much more practical way, in a practical modus operandus. Um, and from this perspective, this conference is indeed uh, very valuable and creates a good um, addition to the political discourse. The event also comes at a very timely moment, timely in that we are preparing the launch of new funding programs, and by the launch I mean actually proper calls and money becoming available, no longer just to talk on the architecture of that. So as of the 1st of January 2014, and we hope also to hear quite something that we can take forward with us in future work programs and in future discussions. I also would like to emphasize very strongly from our side, from the Commission, that we are extremely appreciative for the fact that we actually have a rather inclusive event, inclusive meaning that we have representatives from all over the European Union, uh, from different sorts of countries, that we have people with different sorts of backgrounds, different sorts of generations, and that actually is a major success, and, and we hope that it will contribute to the nature of the discussions that we will have. In the time given to me, uh, I basically want to make three points. I want to present to you a number of facts and figures, um, and that's a selection, a few items, out of analytical work of a significant size. I want to add then later on as a second point something and say something about the European Union policy, and more particularly on the European research area. And of course, last but not least, and that's also what this event is very much about, about funding streams and investment in researchers. All right? So where we start from is, is that we do need a genuinely open and attractive European la uh, labor market for researchers if we want to have a very well-functioning European research area in which researchers and knowledge can move freely. But we know for this as well that we do need to invest in research. 
and our political leaders, countries, have set a target for the European Union of a GDP investment of 3% in research and development. We also know that, on average, on an aggregate level, we're still pretty far away from that. But if we wish to realize this ambition, and we should wish to realize this ambition, we also know that within the European Union boundaries, we will need an additional 1 million researchers to be joining that workforce. Over time, and never mind the hiccup that we have had the past years, but the overall trend over the last 10 to 15 years is clearly that there has been a growth in the number of researchers to be trained and people entering research profession. This slide will look very familiar to many of you who have ever looked at Horizon 2020 because it tries to convey the message that we are not only talking about research investment simply for the sake of science, which is important in its own right, but also that it does matter for our economic future in terms of economic development, in terms of economic growth. And we also know um, that in terms of employment creation and high quality jobs, something we aspire so much within the European Union, that research is actually a key to achieving that. Now, when we look at the facts, then I think overall we can say that we do have a fair and decent stock of researchers. And I also will emphasize that once again, in terms of the flow and people coming in, that progress has been made. But there should not be any mistake about it, that there's still quite a long way to go. And on the data that you see here uh, on the screen, um, hopefully it's as readable to you as the ones that I've printed in front of me uh, on this. Basically what you see here is that when you look at the absolute numbers of researchers within the European Union, where we have about 1.56 million, but that basically means that's full-time equivalent when you look at actually individuals that are about 2.5 million researchers within the European Union and you clearly see that there has been an increase over the past. However, if you translate this into the research intensity in our economy, which is on the right-hand side of the slide, we also see that we have been making progress but also that we are significantly behind our main competitors. Of course, no, I mean, it's quite obvious when you look at the proportional distribution and Figures that I want to point out is when you look at the labor force uh, and we have measured 4,000 workers in the labor force within the European Union we come at 6.64 researchers in the labor force compared to 9.51 in the US and 10.27 in Japan simply to signal that there is significant potential to grow and to increase to make our economies more research intensive that also means more knowledge intensive, and that also means stepping up our capacity to innovate, to create new markets, uh, and get economic advantages of that. When we look at the number of doctoral candidates, and this is where you clearly see uh, in the light blue, the trend has been going up, even if it has been stagnating over the, over the last number of years. And maybe if we add more data, 2012, 2012, which we don't have Eurostat data from yet, it may decline a little. But the overall trend has been going up as an increase of researchers. Some of it, of course, also has very much to do to the fact that on another and very important EU headline objective, and that is that we want to have more people, young people, graduating uh, from tertiary education, that we're also going in, that is a positive trend to reaching our 40% target there. However, there are significant concerns, and these were also expressed at the moment of the informal council here by ministers, is that when we look to a number of areas for which one believes that there will be important for driving technological change like STEM related, even there we see there has been an increase, but the increase has been proportional to the overall increase. So in terms of share, there has not much that has happened, and this remains uh, for quite some an issue of concern. Research in academia, but also one of the challenges that we have, a particular challenge that we have, is research um, outside of academia. And we have been talking already about doctoral candidates, here are some data on uh, the training of PhDs, 
And when you look at the bottom of that, what you clearly see is for skills which are really important when you go outside academia, when you go now in a big business, in a small business, when you want to set up your own company, actually when you go in a cultural sector or anything like that, where you want to uh, increase the research uh, intensity and apply the research, what you see is that a number of skills which are so useful there are really underrated and, and, and researchers report that they have not managed to acquire them during their skills, uh, the, the, during their doctoral training. People management, intellectual property rights, entrepreneurship, uh, we are floating there between 8 and 10, 11 percent. So also here quite some progress to be made. And indeed, what we are looking at is, and, and that's where real change has to come from, uh, a, a change in investment in research and development, but also a change in where researchers go and work, is that we will need, and there is potential, for more researchers to go and work within the um, business sector. So what you see here, it's what we call the European exception. Only 45% of the researchers are working in the business sector. And when you compare this to the US, 78%. And this is where we are very much focusing on, uh, indeed, to see this change. I'll stay for one more second on facts and figures. These are the data related to um, the gender gap uh, and is using the full potential from a gender perspective. And even also when we see improvements there, improvements have been very slow, but there's still a gigantic gap of wasted resources. Women graduate from university, you find already less to the PhD level, and as career progresses, you see less and less women in those uh, more responsible positions, if I might put it like that. And this is indeed also an issue of concern and for policy attention. So these were a snapshot of a number of facts and figures to set the scene. Secondly, I think I should make this smaller, but I have no idea how. I'll leave it. I'll tell you what's on the slide. Secondly, it's on the policy part. Um, and since more than a decade, uh, at the level of the European Union, so the Commission together with the member states, have been working intensively on what is called the European Research Area, which has now become a constitutional objective in the Treaty of Lisbon, an area in which researchers, scientific knowledge and technology will circulate freely. Within this setup, Important steps have been taken, for instance, around the Charter and the Code for researchers, which sets the tone with this Charter, with this recommendation, on what are considered to be good conditions for researchers, conditions related to recruitment practices. Um, there's also specific legislation at the level of the European Union for the access of third country nationals for the sake of research. It's a directive for which the Commission recently proposed to recast one to even improve the conditions for researchers from third country nationals. Also in 2008, there was an important communication, a policy document, basically pushing forward this agenda, which now has been integrated in what is called the European Research Area Reinforced Partnership Approach, where the European Commission, together with the stakeholders, has decided that it was time to become much more practical and that in addition of the intense cooperation with the member states, there's also agreements, there's commitments from the level of stakeholder organizations to take this forward. When we look then at the priorities within the European research area, there are five, and actually they're readable on the screen this time, so five priorities, but I particularly want to zoom in on the one on an open labor market for researchers. But before doing that, let me also emphasize that the importance of an effective national research system is absolutely critical to function also within the EU. Do not expect that a miracle will arrive out of Europe that will solve every national problem. There are national research systems. And what the discussion in the European research area is about is about cooperating better. It's about integrating with one another. It's about together finding common solutions and provide structures to go and do that. But for that, you do need to have very strong and effective national systems that are capable of operating within this domain. When we look at the detail on an open labor market for researchers, I simply singled out eight issues here. 
but for the sake of time, I will only focus on four. And I'll start with open recruitment. If we ask the member states to assess their recruitment practices, for instance in universities, in research organizations, typically member states will report to us and they say, we are perfect. Everything is open, it's transparent, it's merit-based, 100%. When you ask the researchers, they scratch their head and say, well, not in our perception. On average, 40% of the researchers feel, perceive that there is not any open merit, transparent based recruitment process. And in some countries, this goes as far as about 70%, 70, which means that there are significant structural difficulties there. And this is clearly an issue for us at the level of the European Commission, where we do believe that there is scope for member states to improve their national system, to ensure that in terms of demand and supply and providing opportunities, that actually significant steps can be made. Second, and this has to do with uh, the doctoral training, the doctoral candidates. I mean, we have seen a growing number of doctoral candidates over time, so very much supported also by the member states, obviously. But what we also have seen is that there were big divergences in the way of doing that. And we from the Commission, together with the Member States, together with uh, research organizations, institutions and their representatives, through a network that we have with the Member States called the Steering Group Human Resources and Mobility, we have developed seven principles for innovative doctoral training. So best practice based. It's not a rule, it's a principle. But what we want to do is, and what we wish to do, and this has actually been taken on by the Commission, has been endorsed by the Council of Ministers, that when there is funding being allocated to doctoral training, that actually there is a very strong reflection on those seven principles, including the exposure in the international arena. The representative of the Academy, Young researchers mentioned that already, the possibility of being exposed to it, the intersectoral dimension, the possibilities to being exposed also to the business community. And that also requires, of course, that there is pressure exercise on the business community to also offer those opportunities to take this up. So we have set those principles. Um, but there's one thing on the doctoral training, and then I come to my third point, and that's on the career development. When one analyzes the data, you also see very well that when it comes in the post-PhD period, before there is a permanent job, in the postdoc period, that there are a significant number of difficulties in career progression. And there are different sorts of ways, pragmatically, to go about this. And one of them also being for researchers to very well understand what their capacities are, what their skills are, what their possibilities are. And also this is something that we are addressing, together with the steering group, human resources and mobility. And on all those issues, there will be workshops here. And I see people nodding who will be in those workshops, leading on that and taking this forward. And then the fourth uh, element I want to come to very specifically is around your access. And what we as the European Union, and we meaning here collectively, so it's both the Commission and the Member States and organizations on the ground in around 250 centers throughout Europe, and actually with representatives on the different continents of the world, is to connect and with one another and help in overcoming many practical problems. They are practical, they are not necessarily legal, but they are practical. We get on average 150 to 200,000 questions through those networks that are actually can be solved through very practical things to make any change on there. I come now to the third point, and that's on the money, on the funding. And what you see here is a picture of Horizon 2020, very familiar to you, the three pillars on excellent science, which is an agenda set by the research community, on industrial leadership, which is the agenda set by industry and societal challenges, which is basically an agenda set by public authorities. What you don't see on the slide and where you see a little bit of a change over time, and it's, it's not a detail, is that there is a specific initiative as well geared towards widening and spreading excellence, um, basically on break, um, bridging the divide that we see growing at the level of the European Union. Very brief, it's a single program which should be a lot more easy to administer, uh, coupled, uh, very much focused also on coupling research and innovation.
That's what was meant by skills, right? <laughs> so on this, on Horizon 2020, so this is the investment to be made in research, so very much driven by excellence. What we also, and that's a novelty, and I think this is where the real great added value of this event is coming from, is, is that research is not only funded by the European Union through Horizon 2020, but an increasing volume will be coming from the European Structural and Investment Funds. There's discussion on smart specialization, but I think the most important part is, is this is an agenda which is mainly set by the member states themselves in order to take this forward. And it's a complementary approach to be followed there. Very specific on the horizon 2020, to connect those two and to help to bridge the divergence is with twinning, uh, twinning teaming, and ERA chairs initiatives specifically geared to those countries which have a catch-up to do and wish to make up this catch-up. And in combination with that, what we wish to see is a much more inclusive European research area as a result of a combination of the different funding streams. So thank you from my side. Uh, I wish you a very good conference and we're very much looking forward to the outcome of this event. Uh, thank you very much indeed.